Well, good evening to you again. If you would please turn to Colossians chapter 1. We will visit a subject we've visited before. Colossians chapter 1. And I want to talk to you about first place belongs to Jesus in everything. I hear an echo. Is that just me and my sensitive ears? Or First place belongs to Jesus in everything. And we will read verses 1 through 18, really focusing on verses 15 through 18. So out of respect for the word of God, would you please stand as we read Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the world, excuse me, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you, a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for standing. Let's pray together again. Our Father and our generous God, how we hallow thy name. We come to thee in Jesus Christ, our Lord, that great one, that holy one, that altogether lovely one. And Father, we come expecting from thee. And so we ask now that you would be gracious to us. Fill us, Lord, and give us somewhat of the sweetness of heaven. Please be kind to us this evening. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Paul loved the church. Universal. And Paul loved churches locally. And he loved the brethren at Colossae. After introducing himself as the apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the divine will of God, Paul greets all the saints at Colossae. Verses 1 and 2. You will notice in verse 2, it says, to the saints and faithful brethren. Don't think of that as two categories of people. The saints are the faithful brethren, and the faithful brethren are the saints. He tells them of his gratitude to God for their faith and demonstration of love to all the saints, and that he prays for them all the time. And that's very encouraging this love that they have to all saints it wasn't partial and Paul the apostle to the Gentiles reminds them that he prays for them all the time you know I love when people say especially here pray for you all the time because I need it. Brother Jeff needs it. We all need it. He tells them also of the universal effectiveness of the gospel and how it is producing fruit all over the known world. Verse 5 and 6. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard, ye heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. The effectiveness of the gospel. Not only that, this is actually the reality of Jesus' prayer. John 17, verse 9. Jesus prays particularly for the apostles. I pray for these. I pray not for the world. But then when he gets to verse 20, he said, Now I pray not for these only, but for them who, which shall believe on me through their words. The fruitfulness and effectiveness of the gospel. And Paul tells them, you are the byproduct of that prayer. Of Jesus Christ. Then he reminds them. That's verse 5 and 6. Then he reminds them of their faithful minister. Epaphras. Who declared unto Paul and his colleagues. The Colossians love for them. Verse 7 and 8. This moved Paul in prayer. For them. Verse 9 and so on. Furthermore. He tells them what what he was praying or what they have been praying concerning the Colossians. And what a prayer. What a prayer it is. First, they have prayed that these saints would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, having wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 9. And not so much for physical prosperity, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will for them. Our desire, if we can translate it this way, our desire is that you would be filled with understanding, spiritual understanding, and all wisdom to be able to, to discern. They prayed that these saints would conduct themselves in a worthy manner. In verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That, that word worthy has to do with balance. In other words, I think Paul is driving this way. By saying that you may walk or conduct yourselves, your, your lives in a manner that balances with the Lord. 
or we can say it this way. Your life, my life, is to correspond to our profession of the Lord. Worthy manner so that we would be fruitful in every good work, increasing in, lot, in knowledge, if I can put it this way. Lip religion, saying what we believe, and life religion, practicing what we believe, must go together. Must be in harmony with one another. Paul sees if they are to increase in knowledge, Paul sees the Christian life not as something that's stagnant. He doesn't see it as something that's backing up. He sees, his, he sees it as something that's moving forward. Increasing in knowledge, knowledge of who God is, knowledge of who we are. That's the only way we're really going to know who we are if we increase in knowledge of who God is. He sees the Christian life as one of continual growth. It is never meant to be on the same level as we've said. It is to be progressive. We ought to be people growing and moving forward. We ought to go further with God, to know more about God, to walk more closely with God. The more we know about God, the more we know about ourselves. The more we know about ourselves, the more we see we need God. Are we progressing, moving forward, or are we backing up? We were saved not simply to enjoy all the heavenly privileges that we have in Jesus Christ. And we have a lot. But we were saved to serve the Most High. To walk with the Most High. If we lose that focus, we lose the root and heart of Christianity. Saved to serve. <clears throat> Prayers were also made for the Colossians to be strengthened by God's power. Verse 11. <clears throat> so that they would exercise patience with joyfulness. Patient. Joyful patience. Long suffering with one another. Patience with our enemies. Joyfully. How you put that together? Giving thanks unto the Father, who which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul goes on to thank God for bringing all of them into the same family, inheritance of the saints in light, and removing them from one kingdom, that's the kingdom of darkness, and translating them, relocating them, we can say delocation and relocation. Delocation is not a word, but we say it anyways. And putting them into another kingdom. That tells us at least one thing. Well, tell us more than one, but at least one. There are only two kingdoms. And we can't be in both. We're either in one or the other. The kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God's son, which is the kingdom of light. It tells us something also that we were in the kingdom of darkness before being in the kingdom of light. If we're delivered. <clears throat> and he tells us God has done this by liberating grace. That's the word delivered. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Let's not miss this. Notice. God did something. In the kingdom of darkness, we did nothing. We thank the Father 
Why, Paul? Because he has done something. He has delivered us from this power of darkness, meaning we can deliver ourselves. And have translated us. He's moved us. We can do it ourselves. Into another kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son. I can say it this way. We were trapped <laughs> in darkness. And God liberated us. And he tells us that this liberation was accomplished by the blood of Jesus Christ, the very death of Jesus Christ. And I would go on to say that this liberation began in the life of Jesus Christ. And it was through his death, this glorious redemption, this deliverance took place. Even the forgiveness of sins, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. What a prayer. Then he uses that precious word redemption. It has to do with purchasing from slavery. It actually means also just to send away, to deliver and send away. It's one of these precious words that I love. Deliver to set free. Delivered. To make one's own. Delivered. To bring home. Set free. Well after he tells us that. Then it brings us to our. Portion that we need to be in. First Christ. The image of the invisible God. Verse 15. <clears throat> this redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? And this word image can mean likeness. But in this sense, it has to do with the manifestation of God. A, a living embodiment. It also means an imprint. Jesus is this image of God, If I may say it this way, he's the visible image of the invisible God. It shows his equality with the Father. By saying Jesus is the image of God, Paul is telling us in a nutshell and straightforwardly that Jesus is deity. The divine being, if we would say it this way, the divine being has come down. Heaven and Jesus Christ came down to earth. Jesus was heaven on earth. It also represents this revelation of God. We can say it this way. If we are going to know God as we should, we need to study Jesus. He reveals to us, and he is revealed to us as the image of God. And we want to know more about him. As we said, we need to spend time in the Gospels. Studying Christ. I'm not saying we shouldn't read the epistles because we're reading one this evening. And I'm not saying we shouldn't read the Old Testament. Well, the epistles on one hand explain Christ. They tell, they tell us who he is and what he's done. And I'm not saying don't read the Old Testament, which I love dearly, because the Old Testament tells us that Jesus is on his way. And I'm not saying don't read the book of Revelation, because that book tells us Jesus is coming back. But if we want to see something of the character of God, what is he like? Oh, we need to study Jesus. The character and nature of God is fleshed out in Jesus Christ. We see, if I can say, we see it in full bloom in Jesus. And Brother Jeff has been done, doing a fascinating job of showing us Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. 
Well, something else is here. Not only is Christ the image of the invisible God, Paul pointing to his deity. Some in Paul's day didn't think that deity could come and actually become flesh in any way. It's, deity is not connected with creation. Matter. Some think this is an early form of Gnosticism, which, you know, they had this secret knowledge. High form of spirituality. Everything is evil when it comes to matter, which would mean no such thing as an incarnation. That's a second century heresy. But it tells us something else in verse 15, that Jesus is also the firstborn of every creature. Anybody ever talk with a Jehovah's Witness? Listen up. This is their scripture right here. This is it. And it's this portion of firstborn. Not the image, but the firstborn. Firstborn of every creature. And the reason why is this. The word firstborn can mean the first one born. If you're the first one born, the first one what? Created. Since they believe Jesus is a creation and not the creator, they love this passage right here. It can mean to exist before, it also can mean to exist before everything else. It can mean first in rank, class, dignity, or status. So it can mean the first one born or the first in rank and dignity and status. We can say it, supremacy, holding first place. Jehovah's Witnesses look at this particular scripture and say Jesus is the first one created. And if you look at it on the surface, you can come away with that probably. But is that what Paul is talking about here? Let's look at just an Old Testament passage. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about. In Exodus chapter 4, God says to Moses, Say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, wait a minute. Was Israel the first nation? And when Israel went into, I mean, you, you're not a nation with 75 people. You're not a nation with 12 people. And in one sense, to be a nation, you got to have some land. <laughs> they didn't have a land. They were in Egypt. And Egypt was already well established. So what in the world is God talking about when he said firstborn? Israel wasn't the first, name, first nation created. Can't be that. Maybe he's talking about privilege or status. I think that's what he's talking about. Israel was privileged. Israel had the status as God's people among all the nations. You have a similar thought in Jeremiah chapter 31 when God said to Ephraim, Ephraim is my firstborn. Now, which one is it? It's all of Israel or just Ephraim? Well, it has to do with privilege. We find the same thing in Genesis chapter 49 when Jacob calls for Joseph's two sons and, and here's Manasseh and here's Ephraim and Jacob takes his hands, actually Ephraim is on this, and, Man and the Manasseh on this side, Ephraim on this side, I think, because he crosses his hands, and he's getting ready to pronounce a blessing, and Joseph said, no, 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 Dad, he's the youngest. Maybe I got it mixed up. He's the youngest. Ephraim is the youngest. Manasseh is the oldest. He said, no. The firstborn is to get the blessing. Well, he looked at it as rank, status. So what Paul is telling us here, that this passage has nothing to do with the creation of Jesus Christ. Nothing at all. It's a tidbit when these people knock at your door, call the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
But Paul is driving at that Jesus is superior to and is above all of creation. He is the firstborn, class, status. He has the supremacy over all creation. And he's going to unpack that. Context, context, context. Always important. He is not the first in the sense of a chronological order. Christ is distinguished from all of creation, even though he identifies with creation. The drive then is Christ is Lord of all. So this word firstborn means a place of rank and dignity and status. Christ is over the house of God and therefore the governor over all creation. He's the firstborn. And then Paul goes on to tell us in verse 16 onward. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. For by him were all things created. Still has Jesus Christ in mind. Notice Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is creator. That's our next point. Christ, the creator of all things. By him were all things created. Not some things. All things. That are in heaven and that are in earth. Uh, Paul covered everything. <laughs> so let me, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I know you have people there with this high knowledge. I know they think God doesn't have anything to do with matter or creation and so forth. But, and I know you have this understanding of they going into this spiritual realm and, and angels are higher than everything, even higher than Jesus Christ. That was some of the teaching. Paul said, by him were all things created in heaven and in earth. Did I miss anything? He said, I think I covered it all. And just in case I am not clear in what I am saying, Paul said, visible and, and invisible. And invisible. Angelic beings and their ranks. Christ created it all. Government authorities, Christ is over all. Material world, immaterial world. He said, whatever you see and even the things you don't see, Jesus Christ is creator. Fallen angels, he's the creator. He's higher than all, even human beings, visible and their rankings. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. You can put it in any category. He said, Jesus Christ is creator over all. And if he's the creator over all and creator of all, then he's Lord over all. We are simple. But he doesn't stop there. I want to even add that if, and I'm using that word if, yes, if Jesus created all things in heaven and in earth, then all things are under his control. We don't need to fret at the things we don't see. They're under his control. We don't even have to fret on one hand at the things we see because they are also under his control. Heaven and earth. He's Lord over all. But Paul doesn't stop there. Just in case we missed it, he has a book and I love it. By him were all things created. Then he gets down to the end. All things were created by him. Did you miss what I said the first time? I'm saying it again, Paul says. All things were created by him. And then he adds this for the end of all things and for him. They were not created for you and me, but for him. Everything owes its existence to Jesus Christ. If he created it, he can't dispose of it, right? 
from the highest to the lowest, male or female, white, blacks, it doesn't matter. Everything, all things were created by him. We were created so that Christ, he can take pleasure and rejoice in his creation. And we were created so that we could rejoice in him. The end of creation is for him. But Paul still is not done. Some call this a hymn. It's a beautiful one if it is. If it's not, it's still beautiful. Everything created for him, everything created by him, everything under his control, and then he brings us to our other portion. Christ is the sustainer of all things in verse 17, for he is before all things, and by him all things consist. They're held together. They are sustained. But he keeps repeating these two words. All things, all things, all things, all things. Because he, want, he actually wants us to know that Jesus Christ is over all things. <laughs> He holds these things together, Hebrews tell us, by the word of his power. He is sustainer of all. The whole of creation was established by him, and it is upheld by him. Listen, things are not coming apart. Oh, it's all coming apart at the scene. Look at it. Paul said he's sustaining it. The world's a mess. Yes, it's a mess, but he's sustaining it. The country's messed up. It is. But he's still sustaining. Everything is changing. We're in a crazed world. Yes, but he's still sustaining. Things are not out of hand, y'all. Not as long as this passage here is in the Bible. And it's going to stay in my Bible until it falls out. But it's here in the Bible saying Jesus Christ is over all things. All things. That includes our enemies. They are under his control. You did know that includes the election, don't you? You didn't know that? Some said the election is rigged. If it's rigged, it's still under his control. We'll never know if it's rigged or not because we don't have that kind of access to it. Got to be in government. Everything from election to candidates to churches, doesn't matter what it is, Jesus Christ has it all under control. Paul is going to deal with creation before actually he gets to the church. Why? I think because the church functions in creation. Quick question. Do we believe Jesus has all of this stuff under control? Any honest folks here? Hard to trust God sometimes, is it? You look all around and say, what in the world is God doing? Working. Where in the world is Jesus Christ and all of this stuff that's going on? I'll tell you where he is. He's where he's always been, and he is where he will always be, on the throne, controlling everything. If Jesus is not upholding everything, keeping it all together, moving it towards that end in which he will be magnified in the sight of all. If Jesus is not doing that, we might as well throw away our Bibles. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And if he's not ruling over everything, we are in trouble. Especially in light of our nation, we're in trouble. Let me say this. Paul did not tell us that Jesus is receiving any help in sustaining everything. 
he is not telling us that Jesus is struggling to sustain everything. Man, I just don't know how I'm going to keep this thing together. I, I just don't think I can bring it all to its end. Angels, help! It's not what he's doing. He's doing it by the word of his power. Notice, the focus is on he's doing it. Everything's under his rule. That should be an encouragement for the Colossians. And it was. Ah, no matter what's going on, no matter what they're talking about, about these angelic beings, and he goes on in the rest of the book and, and, and alludes to that, chapter 2, chapter 3, no matter what's going on, you're all under Jesus' control. Threats to Christianity, still under his control. It's always been threats to Christianity. Did you know that? You remember Acts? Speak no more in this name. If you do, you know, we've got some bad stuff that's going to happen to you. Well, they kept speaking. We need to keep viewing the fact that Jesus Christ is ruling the world. He's not surprised by what's happening in the world. He's not even surprised right now. I didn't know Donald Trump was going to do that. I didn't even know he was going to say that. I can't believe he said that. That's not Jesus Christ. Not Jesus. How come I didn't know Hillary did that? No, not Jesus Christ. There are people, from our view, things are bad. But you know what? They could be far worse. From Jesus' view, they're still under control. He's not going, I don't know what I'm going to do. The whole creation is dependent upon Jesus Christ. Listen to Psalm 104. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over. That's the waters. That they turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. No one else is doing that. They give drink to the beasts of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their, hab have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. Let me just stop. Right. Well, let me read one more. That he may bring forth food out of the earth. I've said this before. If God doesn't say in rain, sunshine, and the wind for air, if he doesn't do that, all the vegetation will die. And all the animals will die. And guess what? We won't have anything to eat. So what do you think is going to happen to us? We're going to die. God is sustaining everything in Jesus Christ. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted, where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, the fir trees are her house. What a house. God provided it. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness and it is night. Can you see that coming upon us in a little bit? It's been happening all my life. How about you? Day and night, day and night since I've been alive. Anybody who went outside and say, in broad daylight, Lord, let it be night. And it happened. The Lord is sustaining it all. Sun still rises in the east, sets in the west. And we won't change that course. Thou makest darkness and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. Some things I don't mind doing, but I'll tell you one thing I don't want to do. I don't want to run through the woods at night. <laughs> Some creatures just come out at night, and God made it that way. Ah. 
My grandma used to live down a dirt road. I think I'm a little bit brave now. And you couldn't see anything because there wasn't any street lights or anything. And when it got dark and we didn't have that moon, it was dark. And I know snakes travel at night. And so I, I would start at the beginning and probably went mm, about 50 yards or something like that before I got to the house. And I just started running just from the beginning, <laughs> just from the beginning till I got to the house because I couldn't see anything. You couldn't see the road. You couldn't see anything. And there were woods on this side and woods on this side. And I would hear something in the woods every time. You know that speed? It caused me to speed up a little bit. Creatures out at night because God has fixed it this way and he sustains everything. The young lions roar after they pray and they seek their meat from God. The sun ariseth. They gather themselves together. They lay them down in their dens. Man goes forth unto his work. There's morning. Man goes forth unto his work to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Amen. He sustains it all. We were depending on God even before we knew we were depending on God. But Paul still is not done. He comes now after telling us Christ still is before all things and he wants us to keep the, the all things in mind. Then he tells us by him, were all thi- by him all things consist. They're held together. Thou sustained by him. Then he goes on. I'm moved from creation for a little bit. He said, I want you to know something else about Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. After talking about Christ's superiority over all creation, which means we shouldn't even fear man. Remember that proverb? 19, I think, 25. Fear of man bringeth a what? Snare. Chap sure. Fear of man to keep your mouth closed. Fear a man will make you compromise. He said, Christ is superior over all creation. There's nothing to fear. Now he turns his attention to the welfare of the church by encouraging her that Christ is ruling over all and in his church. He's ruling over and in his church. Christ is the head of the church, not the pope. Just in case you didn't hear me, not the Pope, not the pastor, not the members. Christ is the head of the church. He is not the body. He is not the arm. He is not the leg or any other part other than the head. Now We may be an arm or leg or... Whatever other part you want to put there, but we will never be the head. There's one head, and he dictates how the church should function, how it should operate in this world, what it should speak, and how it should live. Does not operate by its clever ideas. Does not operate by his own whims or wishes of men. It operates according to the word of Jesus Christ because he's the owner of the church. He's the one who runs it. The church belongs to Jesus. He is its life. It can't function in a healthy way without him. Can't happen. Not only that, it can't function in a healthy way without him. Let me tell you something else. It can't continue without him. It cannot be effective in the world without him. It cannot overcome in spiritual battles without him. And it cannot stand against the gates of hell without him. The church has to have Jesus.
Jesus is everything to the church and the church is everything to Jesus. It's his bride. He loves her. He cares for her. He protects her. It has its image. Nope, I'm at the wrong place. The church will not be a church without Jesus. He has given the church her manual. And since Christ is the head of the church, then this means, in simplicity, he's the head of the Christian. If Christ is not the head in our lives, then we are not Christians. We can talk about being Christians. We can sing songs like Christians. We can come and hear the word like Christians. But if we are not clinging to and following Jesus Christ, the head, we are not Christians. Jesus is God in the flesh and he created everything. Remember, visible and invisible and he sustains these things and he preserves these things. And the purpose of these things is to bring him glory. Especially when we gather in our worship. But Paul is still not done. Let me add one more thing. He says Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. I think Paul has in mind, here's that word again, firstborn. First rank, status supremacy and I think what Paul is driving at is Jesus is the head of a new creation that resurrection we have a new creation even though he brought in in some way this new creation he's the second Adam over his creation and then he has this word again for us these two words that in all things, they go those all things again. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. Firstborn, that in all things, Jesus Christ would be first. Beloved, creation has been designed in a way so that Jesus would be held up as first in all things. He would be chief superior in rank and have the place of honor and prominence. He holds the chief place. He should. Now just a few questions and we're done. Is Christ first in your life? Simple question. Does he have the place of honor? Is the life fixed on him where Jesus Christ is first? No matter what. That's for your heart and mine. Is he first in our marriages? Are our marriages shaped around Jesus? Let me ask something else. Is he first in the training of our children? When training our children, are we doing it for the glory of Jesus and love to Jesus? Or are we doing it so people can say, oh man, you're so wonderful parents. Your children really behave well. It's Jesus first. Is he first in, in our work? Are we doing what we doing, what we are doing simply for a promotion? And there's nothing wrong with a promotion. Or are we doing it for the honor of Jesus Christ? Can we say that we are laboring heartily as to the Lord and not unto man? 
is Jesus first. Ecclesiastes tells us, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, reads the wise man, do it with all of our might. We're doing it for Jesus. He number one. See, first, when we gather for worship, when we come into this place, is it about Jesus or is it about us? Paul said he's the firstborn among every creature. He's the head of the church so that in all things, creation and church, first creation and new creation church, that in all things, he would have the preeminence, he would be first. You see, first, when we gather in this place, Jesus. Are we shaping our lives in a manner where Jesus will be central in everything? That's a big question. Jesus. God gave us his son. God gave everything he had in giving us Jesus so that we would be a saved people who would serve the Lord so that Jesus would be central in everything. First place belongs to him. Are we giving him that place that belongs to him? I have to answer that question, and so do you. How are we spending our time? The things we read, do we have Jesus in mind? The things we watch, do we have Jesus in mind? The things we listen to, do we have Jesus in mind? I'll tell you one thing. When Jesus died, he had us in mind. When he rose again, he had us in mind. When he went up to heaven, he had us in mind. And he's on the throne right now, and guess what? He still has us in mind. We should have him in mind as first. And what's going to happen? He's going to return. Why? Because he has us still in mind. Well, Paul tells the Colossians, in a nutshell, there's nothing to fear. Jesus Christ is the supreme being. Heaven has come down to earth in God's Son. And he's over creation. There's no need to fear creation. And he's over the church, and he loves her. So that in all things, he will have first place, and we should view him that way. May God help us to do so. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for giving to us all things that we need to walk with you. And Lord, we confess at times we are so selfish. Help us, our Father, to view your Son the way you view him as having first place. Please, our gracious God, Renew our minds afresh so that we would be a people walking with the one who loved us and gave himself for us and washed us from our sins in his own precious blood. Please help us to serve him with all of our might. Hear our prayers and be glorified in our lives, we plead. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and we will just read verses 15 through 18. Thank you for your patience. 
Paul says of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. Let's go in God's name.